Hi, thanks for being here today. Hi, Dorothy. Hi. Glad to see you here. here. Um, oh gosh, I didn't print it good enough. I have to put my glasses on. Okay. Um, yeah, tough to know how to organize this. So I was scratching my head, drawing, trying to draw together all these random thoughts that I had in response to the question of how do we deal with Huntington's perspective about the clash of civilizations. And I thought I would just take you um, with me for um, five minutes or so on um, my perspective on Islam, and, and that includes what I do in classes and the kinds of things that occur to me, and, and see if I can maybe draw all this together. Um, we were talking just before we started about um, democracy and Islam, and um, glad to know we have a student in the audience who's has been working on, on this issue. And the, it strikes me that the, the things I take for granted, knowledge that Islam is one of three Abrahamic traditions, um, that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all sort of different incarnations of the same philosophy, the same God, the same concept of God, the same concept of uh, treating your, your fellow human being well. All of that I take for granted, and I, I realize um, from day to day that maybe that's not what the average person on the street understands about Islam and, and the way that it might fit with Christianity and um, Judaism. Um, that said, um, assuming that we all, we all are on that same um, level playing field right now, let me give you a few examples of the way that I understand Islam, not just from the, the field work, uh, in northern Nigeria and Morocco, but just in, in my daily experiences and my life here in the United States. First of all, let me give you an example. Um, some years ago, I was invited to speak to a Muslim community in Pittsburgh, and um, that community was comprised of African Americans and a growing number of Latinos and Latinas. Um, when I went to speak to them, they, they wanted to hear about Muslim women scholars in West Africa, and lo and behold, there were 500 people in the ballroom of the um, university for this talk. They were interested in my work because I had worked on um, Nana Asma'o, a 19th century Muslim woman in northern Nigeria. And the, the Nigerian uh, version of the book of her collected poetry, some of which is educational, um, and some of which is eulogy and that sort of thing. Uh, the Nigerian version is this book here. Uh, we published it in, my colleague and I translated all the works and published it in this country and then did a Nigerian uh, edition so that people in Nigeria could afford to get it. So what's that got to do with all of this? Well. Um, I talked to people about the tradition, the 19th century tradition, in which this woman <coughs> created a program through which she could train women to go out and educate other women, women who were not able to travel, who didn't have a local school. And so she organized what was called the Yan Taru, which loosely translated is something like the group, the collective. And um, these were extension women extension teachers. So what this group in Pittsburgh did at the end of the 20th century was to take that example of a Muslim Qadariya community, a Sufi community in northern Nigeria, and apply that same model. So this group in Pittsburgh had its own Yantaru organization modeled on the work of this 19th century woman. And her poems flew through the air electronically on their website. So this was a mind-boggling kind of transfer of uh, capability and organization and education from one side of the ocean to another, from a non-electronic age to an electronic age. That was quite amazing. What was more amazing was that in subsequent years I found out there were other such Yantaru branches of local Islamic communities in Hartford, Connecticut, in Houston, Texas, in San Diego, in Los Angeles. And speaking of San Diego and Los Angeles, in those areas there were many Latinas who were involved in these Islamic communities, members of the communities. So with that in mind, I have something else to show you. This is a DVD called New Muslim Cool. 
it is a DVD that uh, recounts the activities of that Pittsburgh um, Muslim community. And one particular young man, Jason Perez, whose Islamic name is Hamza, he used to be a drug dealer and a rapper. Now he's a drug interventionist and counselor and a rapper. And uh, the FBI has been very much on their case. So this is the story of the Pittsburgh Islamic community's um, evolution through dealing with suspicion and FBI surveillance and uh, the ways in which they have been able to be tolerant of intolerance toward them, to build their community, to work with the authorities, and um, to, to make life better for everyone around them. Um, one of that community is uh, Sheikh Mohammed Sharif, who now, because of FBI surveillance, is in China, where he works with Chinese students. And I've um, been in touch with him. He teaches um, children in uh, local classes and adults in adult education classes. So we've got Pittsburgh, Houston, Los Angeles. Um, the next point I want to move to is another way that I understand Islam is um, through the materials that I teach. And, and my most recent um, exciting find is called Heavy Metal Islam. This is about, for, for me, um, this was a real learning experience because I don't understand punk music or heavy metal music or any of that. But there is a thriving heavy metal uh, community in every uh, Muslim community mentioned in this book in the countries of Morocco and Egypt and Palestine and Lebanon. Um, this um, person who has written this book is a professor of history at UCLA and he is also someone who plays the guitar and can jam with these bands. He speaks Hebrew, he speaks Arabic, he knows these people, he's traveled extensively. And the Islamic communities that have teenagers who are involved in music uh, share with teenagers, kids their age, in Western countries the same love of music and it doesn't interfere with or cancel out any of their devotion to Islam. Um, Michigan, moving to another topic, Dearborn, Michigan has, as we know, the largest U.S. population of Muslims in the country. Curiel, Jonathan Curiel, writes in this book about that community and about other architectural and musical and uh, literary influences, <laughs> Arab Islamic influences in um, U.S. culture, and it's been a real eye-opener for my students. Now let's talk about um, unexpected places where you might find Islam. Traveling to take my daughter to a music camp in uh, Concordia, way north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. We took the, the western route through North Dakota, and of course, wherever we stay overnight, I look and see if there's an Islamic center. Fargo, North Dakota. Islamic Center. Wherever you go, you will find an Islamic Center. Um, and speaking of unusual places, let's talk about Kansas. Not just Kansas City, Topeka, Lawrence, and Wichita, but also Salina, Emporia, Goodland, and yes, Dorothy, we are still in Kansas. So there are Islamic communities everywhere around here. Speaking of the Lawrence Islamic uh, the, the, the Lawrence, Kansas City Islamic, uh, the Lawrence, Kansas City corridor with regard to Islamic communities. I know of a very active Pakistani Red Crescent associated community based in Overland Park that regularly has programs and does charitable work um, on the other side of the ocean in various countries. Um, there is also a very strong Iranian community here in Lawrence. There is the Lawrence Islamic Center, where you will find residents of Lawrence and students. You will find students who come here as students and then stay and make it their home. Um, there is the MSA on campus with students from everywhere, Saudi, Saudi, Bosnia, Somalia, Morocco, Tur uh, Turkey, yes, Afghanistan. And some of those students, uh, some of whom are in MSA, um, or were in MSA, have graduated by now, have been 
um, shown in this DVD done by one of our anthropology students uh, some years ago called Because We Are Beautiful. Um, the women in this DVD are from all over the globe, but they share in common a Jayhawk heritage now. Some of them now work in Washington, D.C. One has gone back to Bosnia with her master's in mechanical engineering. So it's far from the stereotype you might have about what Muslim women do. Now, what's my point? How does it relate to Samuel Huntington and why am I talking about it today for this panel? All of these that I have mentioned, all of these people in all of these communities comprise citizens of the West. When Samuel Huntington talks about a, class of civ a clash of civilizations between the West and the Muslim world, we have to say that's hogwash because there is no the West or the Muslim world. There is a multiplicity of types of Muslim communities, just as there is a multiplicity of types of communities in the West. And there is no dividing line between them, neither the West nor the Muslim world is monolithic. So there cannot be a clash of entities when there are no separate entities. We live together like the warp and woof of a rug. And we are all in this together, in the same community. We communicate with one another more often for occasions like this, but on a daily basis, at work, at school. As for the Muslim world, what is the Muslim world? Demographically, the largest population of Muslims is in Indonesia. Um, the fact is that since the seventh century, there is no one place in the world that is exclusively Muslim. In fact, all the world is Islamic, has Islamic communities. And so they, these Islamic communities are as integral to the fabric, the social fabric of the West as any other group that you might be able to describe. And so I have to say to Samuel Huntington, sorry, but I don't think there will be a clash, very happy there won't be a clash, as long as we continue talking to one another. Thanks.